to get going here, uh, I'm not going to dwell on a lot of the, the technical ins and outs of the trafficking issue and how the definition and so forth, but I want to give you some principles or some points to con concepts to kind of frame this issue around. And a lot of this deals with how sex trafficking connects with prostitution. And even with this image here that's up on the wall, I think um, up on the screen, these women in a box, sexualized almost like a cage, right? And I think this is what our society is doing on a massive scale to women, and this is ultimately what sex trafficking is all about. So if you can hit forward for me. All right, now this point has been made to some extent already today, so I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but I have, I have nine points I wanted to focus on, and, and the first one being that victims of sex trafficking are trafficked into prostitution, they're trafficked for pornography production, they're trafficked for stripping, and live sex shows. Okay, so I think we tend to put these different categories of commercial sex in different boxes. But for sex trafficking, we have women being used in all sectors of the commercial sex industry. And it's commercial sex markets, so this means that commercial sex markets, all these different sexually oriented businesses that we heard about, and sex trafficking are symbiotically related. Okay, one wouldn't exist without the other. We have women being trafficked because there's such a um, demand for female bodies to fill these enterprises. There's insufficient demand, and therefore we have to resort to trafficking in order to fill that market demand. Okay, next. Now, I talked about these boxes, prostitution, pornography, stripping, live sex shows. In some ways they're discrete, in some ways they're distinct manifestations of the commercial sex industry, but as I just said, we have women being used in every aspect of these. Um, and for instance, like with um, pornography, pornog if I, a woman might be trafficked into pr prostitution, but she's probably, especially if she's a minor, she'll be thrown pornography in order to teach her what to do in, in prostitution. She's not going to know this. So in this respect, pornography becomes the training manual for her prostitution experience. Stripping. Stripping is just prostitution. Okay, you have, um, you have the, the back rooms where prostitution acts actually occur. You have women who might begin as, quote, dancers, thinking they're not going to be doing actual um, committing actual sex acts, but they burn out in the sex industry and they end up in street prostitution. You have um, women in prostitution, or their, their f photographs being made of them and put on the internet. So these are very fluid things, and women are constantly moving in and out of these different sectors. And if a, guy, if a woman has a particularly good pimp, he's going to be using her in a club, he's going to be posting her on the internet, and he's going you know, to be setting up actual acts of prostitution for her on the side. So it's a very fluid enterprise that's, that's going on. Okay. My next point is that pornography is prostitution for mass consumption. Pornography is prostitution for mass consumption. Okay, what is, uh, what is prostitution? Well, it's a sex act on which something of value is given or exchanged. That's exactly what's happening in pornography. They're performing a sex act and something of value is exchanged. They're remunerated for performing those sex acts. It's just with, in pornography, the, the in-use consumer gets to be hundreds, thousands of people who can consume that woman as opposed to one guy buying a sex act on the street. Okay? So this is w another way of, of framing the pornography issue. And it's, it's just sort of a way, again, you kind of get the idea of, of women being for sale commercially, the way we commercialize women and make them available, just like this was a campaign that was done in Israel, Woman to Go, uh, where they were trying to help people understand uh, what the commercial sex industry is doing to women. It's actually, you know, marketing them, their bodies, their whole selves, and, and putting them up for sale on an auction block. Okay. So to kind of um, wrap up on this point, the existence of prostitution, now, um, all this, again, all together, thinking about pornography as prostitution, thinking about live sex shows, I mean, we, encapsulating the entire commercial sex industry, the existence of prostitution is the only reason sex trafficking exists. These women aren't trafficked to bake brownies. They're trafficked for, the com for commercial sex. I mean, and this, this is an important point, because there are people who will say, oh, we're all about fighting trafficking, 
but you ask them to do anything to curb the commercial sex industry, and oh no, they're not about that. We don't, we don't, women, we don't want the women to be forced into the commercial sex industry, but we, we're completely okay with those who want to choose to be in the commercial sex industry. Okay, so this is the dynamic that exists. Um, those who want to, you know, oh, we're against the force, and, you know, so these overt acts of force, and it's kind of hard sometimes to show overt acts of force. As Steve said earlier, fear is a tool enough, right? Fear is a tool enough, so we don't, and, and in the modern day trafficking scenario, I don't have to, I don't have to beat the girl in order to get her to comply. We talked about how she bonds with her pimp, how she might love her pimp, she might strive to actually please him, right? Um, so, and, and a lot of times, um, the markers of trafficking bear no, there's no outward indicators of the abuse that's there, because maybe it's a threat to her children, maybe it's a threat to her family that is the motivation for her to comply, to participate in the commercial sex acts. So, um, at any rate, it's very important then that we not um, focus on this distinction between forced prostitution and voluntary prostitution. Okay, all prostitution is harmful. Period. Okay, whether it's forced, whether a woman has some degree of higher autonomy, a little bit more agency when she decided to get into the commercial sex industry, I really don't care. I know they're all going to be harmed, and I know that the commercial sex industry is an institution which is just set up to deliver women into this whether they've been conditioned to think that this is empowering or not, that it's ultimately serve, serving the, per, the, the male sex right and the, in the codification of that male sex right, which has legalized these sex industries to exist so that women can be supplied sexually to meet men's demand, um, sexual demand, so that women, so that men can have their sexual needs met on demand. That's what the commercial sex industry is all about. Okay, next slide. Now, thankfully, Steve already couple, a couple, uh, kind of talked about this for me, that prostitution of people under 18 is by that very fact sex trafficking because kids cannot give consent, meaningful consent, to participate in a commercial sex act. But I tell you people, I was at a um, conference about a month ago. And this was a conference that was um, organized by a major group that works on, quote, anti-trafficking. They received funding from the U.S. Department of Justice to organize this conference. It was a national event. Hundreds of people attended. And at this event, people were actually making the argument that children have agency to, to participate in prostitution an anti-trafficking conference where people are raising it like a quite, well, don't children, shouldn't children have, you know, the ability to choose to be in prostitution? Uh, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this was um, at, a, at a trafficking conference in D.C. about a month ago. Okay, now in addition, no, it was U.S. And in addition to kind of, Steve, Steve was talking about, um, the youth shelters, the foster care system. There is a shelter in New York which is taking in runaway and homeless youth and, and one of the groups they're now serving is trafficking victims. But the youth worker in a, in a, in a panel actually said that they will um, change the hours of the shelter so that if a girl is prostituting that she can go out and have a date. So there's a curfew but they don't want to interfere with the child's participation in prostitution, so they'll actually change the shelter hours to accommodate the child going out and turning tricks. Okay, so this is the lunacy that exists, and this goes partly to this idea of what I was just sharing with you about the, the forced involuntary prostitution, and this notion that kids can are well-informed and have the agency and have the, the cognitive capacities to make these kinds of decisions to, to engage in selling themselves. And this is the, this is the sort of Keynesian um, ideology of how you <laughs> help kids in prostitution. Okay, but thankfully under our federal law, we, the federally we have established that any prostitution of kids under 18 is by that very fact sex trafficking. And as Steve said, if we can go back, that the average age of entry into prostitution, some have said 13 here, I think Shared Hope has reported that it's 12. 
Now, that's a, that's a statistic, that's a fact that should make us all kind of gasp. I mean, because that's just an average, right? That means that there's kids younger than that involved in prostitution. But the main reason I include this, as horrifying as that is, is I want you to think about the longitudinal history of that child. Okay? The, <laughs> did she turn 18 and magically decide, oh, now I'm emancipated, I, it's time for me to leave my pimp and go get my um, college, my GED, and go to college? No, she's been conditioned to life in the commercial sex industry, okay? So, unfortunately, when we create this idea that 18 is sort of this magic date by which she's an adult, she's no longer a victim, and um, now she really has um, agency to be in prostitution. But this, what my point being that a child in prostitution is going to become the adult woman in prostitution. Okay, or I mean, then there are boys that this happens to as well, but predominantly it's a female phenomenon. Um, so what I'm hoping is by understanding this is that you'll have more compassion for the adult woman who ends up in prostitution, because more than likely she was a child who spent years in this, and this is the only upbringing she's ever known. Her upbringing is in prostitution, being serially raped day in and day out by men who are buying her. Okay, next. Now, um, okay, I would never say that all women who are in prostitution have been sexually trafficked. Sexual trafficking is a process. It involves very discreet acts. People are recruited, they're harbored, they're transported, um, they're provisioned, they're obtained by force, fraud, and coercion, and then exploited in the commercial sex industry. That's a very specific process that the federal government has defined in a federal trafficking law. Um, and some women haven't gone through that process. Some women have, especially today, in a hypersexualized culture, which is glamorizing the commercial sex industry, which is making it look like um, this really is how you can be empowered. Um, you can find sexual power in being involved in prostitution. So there are some women who have a, a more agency when they get involved, but there are plenty of women who don't have that, who are manipulated, who have had a history of sexual abuse, who um, you know, don't, don't have all this control. But irrespective, whether a woman is trafficked or whether she's not trafficked, her prostitution involvement will harm her irreparably. It's an indelible mark that you cannot eradicate. Well, save with the power of God. <laughs> Okay, there's many people who are investing their lives and trying to undo that damage. But as people like Beth Grant in the back have said, the longer the girl's in prostitution, the harder it is to get the prostitution out of the girl. Okay, so it's a very long healing process. They're, they're really shattered people. Okay. Um, pimps are sex traffickers. I think this is an important point to make because, um, as Steve was noting, the way the law has been kind of interpreted and in the, in the trafficking issues been presented in the media, there's been this sort of notion that the sex traffickers are those guys from foreign countries who bring women and girls here to the states or some other um, developed nation. And that's true. Sex traffickers do do that. But we have um, plenty of people who take care of that enterprise right here in the United States. And they're not called sex traffickers, they're called pimps. And tragically, pimps are cool, right? You pimp your ride, right? You got guys like we've talked, people have talked about Snoop Dogg being America's favorite pimp, uh, as that was reported on the um, cover of Rolling Stone. And you've even got guys like Ice-T up here, a former pimp who's now a celebrity. Gets, his, gets to be on the show Law and Order. If that's not irony, I don't know what is, okay? But pimps are sex traffickers. They recruit, they harbor, they transport, provision and obtain by force, fraud, and coercion for purposes of commercial sexual exploitation. That's the definition of a sex trafficker, and that's the definition of a pimp. So let's not have any um, rose-colored glasses on it about what pimps do. And you may, some of you, anybody see the movie Hustle and Flow by chance? Well, um, Interestingly, it won it run an Academy Award for the best song for, in that year. Do you know, anybody know what the song was? Yeah, it's hard out there for a pimp. Like, oh, really? 
another Hollywood fairy tale. And it gets rewarded with um, uh, an Academy Award for the best song. Okay, next. Now, the success of prostitution and sex trafficking industries hinge on a consumer, and the consumer is the male sex buyer. Predominantly, it's overwhelmingly male. Next slide. And these are some of the poor souls who make up that population. And, and yeah, as Judith says, they're imp they've, they've been made really in some ways impotent because more than likely they've been, have been you know, porn consumers for ages. Now they're acting out and, and going out and buying women on the street or on Craigslist. And one of the points in showing this is not to, sh you know, not to just try to humiliate these individuals, but just to show that, th that these are human beings. They come from every walk of life, every, you know, eight. You can just tell there's just a wide range of, of people involved here. But <laughs> if we could survey them, I definitely think pornography would be a common thing and a common a factor in their lives. Um, and I really feel that their lives have been destroyed. They're being wrecked by uh, what Playboy, what others have been on um, this sexually toxicity that has been pumping into them for, for generations, for years. Next slide. Now, you know, this picture, there's a lot, of, we could spend a lot of time talking about it and analyzing it, but I, I'm going to use it now to reinforce this idea of the demand. Okay, here, <laughs> this is a woman being offered for sex on the streets. This is in Mexico. And, you, you know, there's this predatory environment that is surrounding her. Now, you could put her, you could put a woman on a strip pole there, just as easily. Um, the women who are involved in pornography, but this is this, these masses of men are just standing around and gawking at her and like, you know, and just think to yourself, what is going through these men's minds right now when they're looking at her? What is it that they're thinking? What is it that they're wanting? Is there anyone really to intercede on her behalf? Okay, next slide. Um, another important point is that a high prevalence of foreign-born women in a country sex industry is highly indicative of international sex trafficking. Okay, so if you've got um, a whole lot of women from other parts of the world making up a sizable percentage of your commercial sex industry, hmm, how are they all getting here? Uh, they, did they just wake up and just say, oh, I'm going to go be a prostitute in Las Vegas today? Probably not. Um, and you'll notice how the sex markets actually advertise lots of different ethnicities. And so this sign from this Kong in Ho Hong Kong is advertising Malay women, Chinese women, Russian women, etc. Next slide. And you can really get a sense of this. These are yellow page ads from Las Vegas. And this particular ad is one of the, the most textbook examples I've ever seen of how the sex industry is really trying to supply a cornucopia of women that can, that can be used for commercial sex. Women from Japan, Korea, Hawaii, Philippines, China, the U.S., Vietnamese, Thai, European, and Malay women, all in that one ad. Um, let's see what else we have over here. There was um, Asian Angels, Black Beauties, Venezuelan Playmates. And so really, Las Vegas is your smorgasbord of prostitution uh, for women of any ethnicity. Next slide. And another good case in point is the Netherlands. Now, this is a country that has legalized prostitution, and 60 to 70 percent of the women in prostitution in that sex industry are not even <laughs> citizens of the EU. They're not citizens of the Netherlands. They're not even citizens of the EU. So they're coming there from all around the world. And what this to me indicates is that the Netherlands has a predatory dependence upon a foreign supply of women to make up its sex industry. There are not enough women in the Dutch system, the Dutch countries, to fall through the social safety nets, to, to end up being in prostitution. So the, ne so the Dutch have to um, bring in women from around the world who predominantly are coming from developing parts of the world in order to, to meet the demand that's been created by legalized prostitution there. Okay, next slide. And I think I'm about <laughs> to be hooked off the stage. A <laughs> um, Couple more quick points. The vast majority of adult women in prostitution experience levels of physical and psychological coercion and torture that plainly classify them as victims of sex trafficking. 
And this is a hugely important point because people are, I hear a whole lot about fighting child sex trafficking. Because for one thing, we don't have to, under the federal law, we don't have to worry about this force, fraud, and coercion part of the trafficking definition. And like Steve was saying, we just said automatically, federally, if you're under 18, you're a victim. But when they're over 18, we have this higher standard that we have to prove. But most people are looking at those women as just prostitutes. They're not trafficking victims, they're just prostitutes. But if they're involved with a pimp, I can promise you the violence, the, the horror of their daily experience clearly equals force, fraud, and coercion. They are victims of sex trafficking. And, and as you can see here, this is just one um, quote from a pimp who was complaining because his hand swelled up so much because he beat his bitch too much. You know, can you imagine the woman's face, her body, if, if, her, if his hands are swelling? Okay, next slide. And Mary Ann showed some of these images earlier. So these are <laughs> the physical effects of prostitution involvement. This is the toll that it wrecks. So there's no question, you know, she's over 18. Is she, you know, are we going to say she's a victim or not a victim? Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. She's, she's one of the most arrested women for prostitution in that particular county of Florida. It's a horrible case. Next slide. Okay, so lastly, to wrap up because I'm running out of time, sex clearly is not work. It's not a job. So one of the things I hope we can take away from this is that we not discuss it in those terms. If we use phrases like commercial sex work or sex work, we are normalizing the harm of prostitution. Okay, so we might be well-meaning, we might not be wanting to call women this pejorative term prostitute, and clearly it is pejorative, it carries with it, it's very laden, um, it's with all these connotations of being dirty, of being a whore, uh, but um, we don't want to at the same time normalize um, this torture of women as a job, as a form of work. So we, um, in the back and up here, I'll, I'll put them out up here, uh, I have a handout for everyone that has terms to use and not to use and why. Okay, so this is recommended terminology about how we can frame um, our discussions about the commercial sex industry. So not saying um, commercial sex work, not saying, not saying child sex worker. That'll drive my <laughs> colleague Alicia through the roof if you call, or if you call one a child prostitute. Woo, watch out. There's no such thing as a child prostitute. There's only a prostituted child. They've been abused, okay? Um, and then, just to, to end, I, I'm not going to read this whole thing, and I promise I'm quitting. Um, that in the back, on the back table, there's more of these as well. Um, to just drive home the point that prostitution isn't a job, like any other job. It's not a form of work. Um, I have a, a, a prostitution job description that was developed by a group called Whisper, which was, uh, it's no longer in existence, but that it stood for uh, women heard in systems of prostitution engaged in revolt. And they devised this really clever help wanted ad for women and girls, do you want this job? So I'm just going to read a couple parts of it here. Women and girls applying for this position will provide the following services being penetrated orally, anally, vaginally, with penises, fingers, fists, and objects, included but not limited to bottles, brushes, dildos, guns, or, and or animals, being bound and gagged, tied with ropes and or chains, burned with cigarettes, or hung from beams or trees, being photographed or filmed performing these acts, workplace, job-related activities will be performed in the following locations, in an apartment, a hotel, a massage parlor, car, doorway, hallway, street, executive suite, fraternity house, convention, bar, public toilet, public park, alleyway, military base, on a stage, in a glass booth. Now, I don't know of any of us who would submit an application. So, I just, you know, this just to me drives home the point of why um, we need to be creating a society that's protecting women and girls from this type of exploitation, not enshrining and codifying a right to prostitute. 
as so many are suggesting. And again, at that conference, um, they were at an anti-trafficking conference. They were advocating um, legalization of prostitution. Okay, so I, I, they haven't read the job description. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>